Hello, and welcome back to the Sustainable Brown Girl podcast. This show exists to provide representation for women of color in the environmental space, to highlight their stories, and to educate the masses about how to be more eco-friendly every day. From gardening to thrifting, minimalism to veganism, sustainable business owners to influencers, environmentalists to activists, we are all on a journey to taking better care of our bodies and our planet. I'm your host, Ariel Green. For decades, China and other Asian countries have been the main hub of textile production. But now eyes are shifting towards Africa. With major potential for growth, African development is on the rise. In today's episode, we'll be discussing the benefits of manufacturing in Africa and how more companies can get involved. But before we get too deep into that, I want to remind you to leave a review on Apple Podcasts. It's super easy to do on any Apple device. Just search for Sustainable Brown Girl Podcast and be sure to follow if you aren't already. Then scroll down to the review area and I'm sure you want to leave a five-star review, so go ahead and do it. It really helps us with getting more people to discover the show. Be sure to leave a review on Apple Podcasts, and I will feature it in an upcoming episode. If you're not already, be sure to follow Sustainable Brown Girl on Instagram and use the hashtag Sustainable Brown Girl to be featured on the page. I love seeing what everyone's up to, their sustainable swaps, their outfit inspo. So I love sharing that on Instagram. Also, if you have a few dollars to spare, please consider becoming a Sustainable Brown Girl patron on Patreon. It really helps to keep the show going on a consistent basis, and you'll get access to some exclusive content. A link to the Patreon page is in the show notes. As always, your support is greatly appreciated. Today's featured sustainable brown girl is Jacqueline Shaw, a fashion designer, consultant, and founder of Africa Fashion Guide, a social enterprise promoting sustainability within Africa's fashion and textile industry. Through her organization, Jacqueline consults clients on building and growing their African fashion business while positively impacting communities throughout Africa. Thank you so much for joining us today, Jacqueline. Thank you for the invite. It's such a lovely um, opportunity to to share with your your listeners and yeah, yeah, I'm really excited. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, me too. So I always like to start with getting the backstory. Mm -hmm. So can you tell us about how you became interested in sustainability and fashion? You know, it's a funny one because I always say. Um, I mean, fashion, I'm, I'm just a creative person. I've always been sewing things and making things. You know, if it's pinball games from, you know, um, boxes of cereal, mm -hmm. sewing for my toys back in the day, I would always be, be doing something kind of fashion related. But the sustainability one was kind of a weird one. When I was at um, my, my bachelor's degree back in uh, 1999 to 2001, I was just interested in the ozone layer and the, the, the stories around that when there was a big discussion about the hole in the ozone and, you know, greenhouse mm -hmm. gases and so forth. And, you know, looking at doing things with more natural fabrics, that was really um, the, the route that I was taking. Wow. Um, well, the route that I was interested in, but I didn't really, at the time it wasn't called ethical fashion or sustainable fashion. Right. It wasn't called that. It was, um, I don't really know what we called it back then, eco maybe or something like that. But I just was interested. But I never thought to pursue it as a career. Yeah. I did I did um, become interested further um, along the, the journey as I started to travel a lot to, um, to, to countries and to learn more about the, the fashion industry and how it worked. And I would see things and I just thought there's, there must be a better way of doing it. And that's what I decided to do um, later on in my career in 2009 to 11. So 10 years later, I decided to do a master's in ethical fashion. It was the first one of its kind. And um, yeah, I did that as my degree and my master's degree. And from there, it's just opened up the door to everything else. So it's been an interesting journey. 
Right. Wow. So before you um, started your ethical fashion uh, master's program, you mm. worked with other, like, did you work with bigger brands? I saw in your bio, you worked with Puma and Fila mm. and large brands like that. Exactly. So my career was after my master, after my bachelor's degree back in 2001 and I finished, I went into the industry and I ended up in sportswear. Just by chance, it was even very interesting because I was more, when I, when I was sewing, I would always sew more woven pieces, more tailored pieces, mm-hmm. like wedding dresses and things like that. Mm-hmm. As a designer in my career, I was in, you know, got into sportswear and swimwear. And so my career just evolved in me designing for these brands. I had the opportunity to live and work abroad in different countries and designing for international brands and retailers. And so that's been on my career um, or up until today, I mean, I'm not working in fashion today. Um, I'm really more focused on my business as well now. Mm-hmm. But, um, yeah, it was really good way to, as I say, to cut your teeth in the industry <laughs> to to work for these brands and to really understand. And Puma was where I had probably the biggest time of my career, which was seven years. Wow. And um, it was very interesting because with Puma, they had a mission to be the most sustainable sports lifestyle brand in the world. Really? Um, yeah, at the time. I mean, they under after I left, they went under new management and then things changed. By the time, they were really interested in that direction. Mm-hmm. And so I was able to be a sustainability ambassador for them. And then I was the same at um, a company in Germany that I worked for as well called C&A. So it, it's become a big part of, um, you know, my career and my focus and how to just do things ethically. And now with my own business, it was all about sustainability within Africa's fashion industry. And um, now it's even involved even more to, you know, building, seeing trade as a tool and fashion as a vehicle to bring change in Africa. That's how I, one of the quotes that I say, because that's what I truly believe, that fashion yes. can be that vehicle of um, change um, to bring, you know, when you bring trade to communities. So, Yeah. Wow. Yeah, that's that's really interesting. So would you say that by working with those larger brands, did it kind of push you more in the direction of wanting to do things more ethically after seeing how, you know, uh, large brands typically do things unethically? Yeah, I just wanted to learn more. I mean, like I said, because of back in the day, I was looking at the ozone there, it was always something, it was always something that, um, I was considering like, okay, what, what's better materials that we could use? Okay. Um, I think hemp was a big thing then. Yeah. Natural fabrics, just cotton. So just natural fabrics. It wasn't so much of like lyocell and all these, you know, eco fabrics that we got out today, like, you know, mushroom leather and, mm-hmm. you know, recycled <laughs> polyester and all that. They really had that. So it was more about um, natural fabric. I think bamboo was starting to become a thing, but, yeah, at the time it was more about the materials that we used. And then um, working for the brands, I got my eye what was open to a bit more about the industry. Mm-hmm. And so I, you know, I learned more about the new fabrics that were coming out. And I was like, there must be other ways of doing things. And then working with Africa, a lot of those fabrics aren't available on the continent. Most of them are right. made in Asia or in Europe. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, it was more about just how to, more about the artist, more about slow fashion, do things slower, craft, artisan. Um, and that was the focus of um, when it comes to Africa and their sustainable stories, the sustainable fashion stories there. Right, I see. So then what led you to start Africa Fashion Guide? Like, did you grow up in Africa? Did you spend time there? What, you know, what kind of led you in that direction? When it happened, I decided to focus my, when I did my ethical masters, ethical fashion masters, I decided to focus on Africa's um, textile industry. So I looked from the, from the raw material from cotton through to the manufacturing of clothing. So I looked at everything from jewelry to uh, meals to dyeing to, you know, the production of fabrics through to the production of the clothing, shoes, accessories, homework, et cetera. So mm-hmm. I looked at my whole kind of industry as a supply chain. And as a value chain as well, and how there was a lot of gaps and losses within that. And I, um, I mean, prior to that, I, I mean, growing up in London, um, especially the age that I that I am and I was, I guess, 
many of the the, the black and brown people um, of my age group, we were like first generation born uh-huh. in the UK. So our parents were, you know, um, they would have come over from somewhere else. So if it's an right. African country or a Caribbean country or uh, India, Pakistan or Bangladesh um, or Sri Lanka, they would have been, you know, um, we would be the, the children of, of these em- immigrants. Mm-hmm. Um, so for, for me, I had a lot of my friends I grew up with, you know, parts of London was very much, um, I wouldn't say segregated, but it was, you'd have areas where it'd be mostly Asian, mostly Pakistanis or many um, Africans or many Caribbeans, for example, and just going up to the areas I did, mm-hmm. I would be around um, many um, and Nigerians and Ghanaians. And so I just like textiles. So when I would start to, you know, go to some of the my friend my friends and friends like, oh, we're having a naming ceremony or something like that. It was a wedding. I'd get yeah. invited to, I'd get asked to sew something for their in Ankara. Um so cool. and then <laughs> I would just love the fabrics and like, oh what's this and what's that? And I'd learn more about it, the different cultures. And I got my juices going and so I wanted to go, you know, to you know, to Africa, to these countries that my friends had told me about, I wanted to go there. So I did. Um, my first trip was to Ghana. I mean, outside, when I'd been to like, Morocco prior to that, mm-hmm. I wanted to go to what I call Black Africa. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, just going to Ghana and I went back that same year and I went back the year after and then I started to go to more countries and wow. develop this business. Because that was around the same time as I decided to do my master's. Mm-hmm. So I decided to develop this business, which was all around that. Wow. So yeah, it was. Um, it, it's been a journey. It's been a journey, but so you can say I was inspired from my career. I was yeah. inspired from my friends and the area and my my upbringing and the areas that I grew up in, and um, just looking at my own heritage as a Black British woman. Um, you know, it all kind of worked together, and that's what it made me decide that I was going to do that and I never mm-hmm. planned to do a business it just happened after my degree people said oh you know you should do more of these I did a conference and the book and he, he said you do, should do more could you help me to find ABC in Africa do you know where I should yeah. go and so I was like okay yeah. you know now I kind of have a business but I never planned it <laughs> but wow. um, it's been it's been a great a great journey um you know business isn't easy but I really do do love what I do yeah, that's great. I mean, you know, loving what you do is the biggest part of it, <laughs> you know, and then especially when you're helping people and trying to make a difference, that's also important. So what types of services do you offer people through Africa Fashion Guide? Yeah, so there's different aspects of it. So there is, um, you know, we do events, so we do um, conferences, we do business trips where we take people to the con- continent to meet with manufacturers in different countries. Um, I do um, go to schools, universities and do talks about it, do public speaking. So there's kind of that kind of aspect of more events and um, in-person things. And then um, there's like the digital training I have. So the digital tools, um, coaching with group memberships and um, also one-to-one coaching. And then I also do consulting as well. But the biggest um, focus and what we're launching um, coming up um so this March, it should be out now, is our um, sourcing platform. So think of like Alibaba for Africa, for example. Oh. You know, it's um, mm-hmm. a B2B platform that um, you can register to go on there and then you can go and source your supplier or you know, find your manufacturer, your, your vendor for your different or fabrics for um, manufacturing of, of clothing, footwear, homeware, accessory products. So that's what I'm really excited about. Just um. Yeah, it's a lot of work behind the scenes, but it's, it's you know, it's giving people opportunity to connect and to bring trade. But that's going to be an, on, it's an ongoing project. We're going to continue to upload it, continue to add to it regularly and continue to invite more and more small businesses, booster buyers to come and, and um, yeah, to access it and do trade with Africa. Yes, that sounds very exciting. So yeah. do do you work with people who make particular products, like, say, for example, hand-woven baskets? Or 
do you work with people who are looking for a particular material or is it a combination of both? Everything. Okay. <laughs> uh, like all the, so there's the two, the two groups of people, the suppliers who we call the supplier partners. Um, so you could, you know, you could be a, a basket weaver in Bogotanga in Ghana or Rwanda or you know, Tanzania, Kenya or down to um, 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 a manufacturer in Lesotho or you know, um, Morocco for, for earrings or rug carpet making into mm-hmm. cotton, generally cotton mills um, in different African countries to T-shirts, the T-shirt manufacturers in Nigeria, in Tanzania. So, you know, those are the supplier partners. And then we have businesses who will come to us who could be um, small businesses, like people who just want to start a fashion brand in Africa that's made mm-hmm. in Africa, through to, you know, um, a retail or a larger brand who wants to just source basic products in Africa, but in large quantities. So, um, and then there's uh, people who would come for an actual project who wants me to help them to develop their um, their fashion businesses in in that in that particular African country or to work on a project. So it's it's a it's it's, it's a variety of um, of work that we do, services, and the people that I work with. But it's 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 really really interesting what I'm learning every day. Yeah, I bet. I can imagine. Yeah. So how do you typically find suppliers? You know, how, how would you find the women who are making the earrings and, and stuff like that? A lot of the time in the beginning, when I was starting up, I was doing a lot of networking, speak, you know, traveling to countries multiple times throughout a year. For the last 10 years, I've been doing that. And then I would also, you know, uh, meet with um, um, ministers of trade, I would do that in, in um, various countries. I would I do speak at a lot of events and there's organisations and so forth that I would just be get involved in because for me, it's all about the network. Mm-hmm. Um, yes, you can go and do internet searches. Of course, you can do that. And that will end up being part of it. I do get a lot now who just get in touch because of the work that we've done. Mm-hmm. Um, but in the beginning, it was getting out there and just finding um, finding people by walking around by speaking to people and then they connect you and like I said by um, government organizations as well who would help me um, because of the work that I was trying to do. Right. I see. Wow. And when you work with these people, I mean, I'm assuming that typically, you know, well, when I, when I think of a basket weaver or a woman making earrings, you know, I think of someone, you know, in a, you know, just like an independent worker. So they, I feel like, you know, have a great, have a greater impact with being able to work with a larger supplier than, you know, than a business that has a, you know, a wide range of people. Is it typically a single person that you're working with or is it maybe a business or, you know, a conglomerate of people who produce a particular product? It's, it's different because there's some cooperatives that we work with and then there's some, um, I try not to, to work just with a single maker. They tend to be mm-hmm. a business because the single maker, they're going to struggle with producing. So many of them are part of a co- um, cooperative or okay. they are part of a business, um, a, you know, a group of people or, or they, they represent other people as well. So, um, you know, that I just find that's easier to go with somebody who's representing the others. Mm-hmm. Um, but there's also, you know, many of these um, artisans may be based in, in regions that are not in your main, like Accra or Lagos right. or Abuja or, you know, um, um, Nairobi or some of them may be a, bit, a little bit further out. And then, you know, I can't go there just speaking English or, you know, right. or French or, you know, European languages. You know, they'd be speaking their their local dialects, and you know, I wouldn't have that ability to um, speak that. So I'd need um, you know people who are already doing things there, who already set things up, and then also because it's a business, you want to make sure that you know you go work with people who can deliver as well, so they've, mm-hmm. they've got, they can you know set up and doing things. In my next stage, I would love to be able to do more with those who may not be part of businesses which are already established, already you know doing things. I'd want to be able to work more with artisans 
um, and help them to up level because, like I said, the whole focus at this stage of my business after 10 uh, to 12 years is about building trade. So, you know, capacity building is going to be a major part of our next steps. Okay, I see. That makes sense. So you mentioned earlier that you're building this new network where, you know, kind of similar to Alibaba. What, rather than going to or buying products from for, that are made in China, why should people shift towards buying products from Africa? You know what, there's, um, first of all, you know, even the World Bank has said how you know, nearly half the world by 2050 is going to be Africa. Mm. And you know, there's, there's many points. I mean, Africa is, is one of the largest popular, the second largest um, continent um, when it comes to population. Right. You know, you've got Nigeria and Ethiopia and South Africa, which has the biggest populations on the continent as well of people. It's, it's a place where there's a huge market of people where there's going to be huge growth. Um, the numbers are just growing. And you're finding that, you know, those who are, who are business savvy, they will look at markets where there's going to be change, there's opportunity. Africa's got, if you're in agriculture, Africa's got a lot of land. It has the mm-hmm. opportunity to feed the world with its land. Mm-hmm. Um, and if you can tap into that, you're going to have a business that's future, um, that's built for the future. And so, you know, just with the fact of the population, if you're looking for, somewhere to to do business you should look at africa you should not not have africa in your um in your plans whether it is setting up there's manufacturing or if, if, if or whether it is um um looking at that there's a population of people to sell to right you know when you hear that facebook and twitter and um at the alibaba guy himself and you know, um, many of these um, big tech companies are going into the continent. It tells you something, and they're seeing opportunity. And as business owners, we have to be savvy and do that as well, because some of the big world giants are um, are struggling. So even they are getting in baby Africa as well. Right, right. When I hear that, you know, Africa is growing and whatnot, and they have all this land and stuff, I'm always worried about them being exploited, you know? <laughs> I worry that it's going to turn into the next China or the next Indonesia, where there's all these low-wage factories, um, you know, and they're exploiting the workers. Do you have any ideas on how we can avoid that? This is all, this is all going to be down to the mindset of those who are going in there. And mm-hmm. my thing is working with the continent. So it's not about I'm here to, to take from Africa. It's about I'm right. here as a middleman to connect, to bring people together, to build trade. So it's encouraging supply chains to value chain, sorry, value chains to be grown on the continent um, more. So rather than exporting the raw materials and then, you know, um, um, exporting them to so-called first world countries and then uh, manufacturing them there, do that on the continent to, to keep the GDP, to grow the, the, the GDP on the continent, uh, keep the manufacturing there to be able to you know, have extra, provide extra work, keep the manufacturing there so the farmers can also have, you know, look at maybe they can expand their business and not just grow oranges, but to also manufacture orange juice Mm-hmm. and sell cartons to the world. So, you know, it's, it's, it's all going to be down to, you're never going to be able to change the world in a way. There are going to be some bad people. You can't change that. All right. we can do is be the change that we want to see. So if you're there and you want to um, see change in Africa, see Africa in this rightful spot, as I believe it should be, you know, one of the top countries, top countries, listen to me, top continents in the world, then that's going to take... Um, working with the continent and building um, supply chains, building trade with the continent and internally that Africa to do more within its own. So it's not just focusing on, oh, you know, the Chinese opportunity, the American opportunity, but it sees its own Africa as its local opportunity. That would be great. That's what I would love to see more of and I'd love to do more on the continent with the continent. Yes, definitely. I agree that that would be the best way to prevent 
you know, the prevent it from being kind of how, you know, <laughs> other yeah. some uh, Southern uh, Asian countries to, you know, how they've seen fast fashion, like destroy their mm. countries pretty much, you know, I would, yeah, I hate to see that in African countries too. So yeah, I think the, what you've said is, is a great way to help prevent that. Um, are from the people that you've worked with, do they seem like they are cognizant of maybe, you know, trying to prevent the riffraff from, from staying out, you know? Say that again, sorry. Are they, from the people that you've worked with, does it seem like they are trying to, you know, work ethically as well to, you know, help make sure that fast fashion companies and places that would try to exploit them kind of stay out of their areas? I don't know. I don't always see that. I don't, I, I see, I mean, there is a mindset in some places. And I'll give you an example. I, um, some years ago, I did a project with an Italian um, charity who was doing something in Togo, Lome in Togo, in West Africa. And I was invited to come and do some training in uh, 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 Trento or Trento in Italy. And I was in, invited to go over also to Lome in, um, in Togo to do the same training. It was like an exchange thing they had. And I remember going over there to Lome, and I actually, I actually love the country. I love Togo, and um, I remember the it was a girls' school, and then they heard that this somebody's coming from England called Jacqueline Shaw. She's going to be giving some training on to these young students on like sustainable fashion, African fashion. And then when they saw me, I mean they're mostly French speaking, but they spoke English. Some of them spoke English as well. Mm-hmm. When they saw me, they go, "Oh, no, we thought you were going to be white." When we saw mm-hmm. your name, we heard your name, but you know, you look like us. Yeah. And, you know, they tried to give me some of their, uh, <laughs> their version of that, their jollof rice and their pepper soup. <laughs> it was, you know, nice. laughing at me. Yeah, how spicy it was. But it was, <laughs> you know, but, but it was so, it was just, it was just so, because for me, that's what's important is that representation. They don't just see, you know, that they, that, that if you're white, that you, that, those are the only people who can come and do things, who can come and right. do, come and support. But they can see there's a black girl from England. She looks like us. You know, I'm not going you know, uber fabulous. I'm going there with my natural hair. I'm going there a bit chubbier. I'm going there, you know, just normal. Yeah. And not overly dressed, just going there just normal. And there to do, you know, to train these young, young people, you know, show them the opportunities they can have even in, you know, the field of fashion in their country. And um, it was just nice to be able to to do that um, through through this project. And I think, you know, there's always going to be this mindset that oh, it's going to be the white person is going to come and, and do the change. Mm-hmm. But you know, for me, that's why it's so important that I stay I stay in the field, being the the non African, being the Black British girl, being the person that's unexpected, and you know. And but I'm still my heart is to, to to bring to build connections and to bring trade opportunities. So um yeah, that's how I see it. that's just how I see it. Yes, yes, I love that. That's a great point to bring up because you know I always say representation is so important. And yeah. like you said, for people to see that you are a black woman and you know you're able to make these connections and help businesses grow that's a you know that's a major thing so that's awesome i love that thank you yeah i love it i love it too yeah so i want to talk about trends in african fashion and uh if there are any popular textile exports that you see popping up like what are people typically buying you know what I'm seeing a lot um, more these days is that um, there's been more of an interest to in the, the traditional textiles, mm-hmm. in the printed textiles, and, the, and and people who are focusing on that, like companies who are bringing that to new markets. It's yeah, it's just really good to see. It's really good to see. Um, that it's not just about wax print, wax print, Ankara, right. or Velisco. It's about 
fabrics that are being made by hand, some old traditions, um, indigo fabrics, um, you know, age old traditions, um, batiks, adire, uh, the kente, the, the, the done funny cloth, the country cloth, all of this that people are doing. That. And because there's been a big move in homeware, I found over the last couple of years that, um, even more, that uh, people are tapping into some of these um, traditional textiles and basket weaving, sisa, raffia, different grass. And, you know, it's just really good to see. Right. Yeah. Um, I know one of the big problems with the, uh, well, in Accra, you know, there's the um, large secondhand market where a lot of, um, you know, thrifted clothes and stuff end up there. And I've heard that it has really, you know, dampened the local market, you know, for people to buy and sell things made locally. What, um, what's my question here? (laughs) How, how, how do you, let's see. Actually, I don't know what I'm trying to ask, but I, I guess I just want your opinion on on that, on the whole secondhand market and maybe how we can help, uh, you know, people to kind of start buying things and, you know, have more of a, a stronger local market. Um, I mean, that's, yeah, when I did my master's, that was one area that I focused on was secondhand clothing. And it's this is an industry problem. Um, it to do with you know consumerism from from one part of the world, and then um, you know how it's because of the lack of manufacturing in other part of the world that the secondhand clothing is a trade opportunity for you know those who are in that business of it. Um, you know, I did a whole set of research about I did um, some focus groups and so forth. Um, in African countries and I was surprised by the results that I got from that I thought it would be something that was hated but you know from the young people who bought these clothes they loved it I remember going to Kenya and there were these young, young bloggers that I used to um, connect with and they would you know always go to one of these second and clover markets and they would you know you know it was it was a, it was a cool thing you know it was a cool thing to get you know it wasn't called vintage it was just called it was just these second and clover markets but mm-hmm. you know, where you in in this part of the world that I'm in, we're used to fast fashion as the thing, and out there that is, a, I guess, their fast fashion. Right. And, um, I don't like it. I don't like the idea of it. I don't like the fact that kind of the dumping of it, and people are making a lot of money from you know um, the industry. Um, I think that I'd just like to see more manufacturing. Um, on the continent of its own products from the raw materials through to the manufacturing for its own communities. I think that is, that's how it should be. But, you know, yeah, it's, it's, it's a tricky one. It's a tricky one because it's, it's industry. It's, it's, it's so embedded in industry. And some people will say, well, there shouldn't be any manufacturing because it's making more products and then that's aiding to more, more, you know, consumerism or aiding to more production and more waste. So it's you know you have to choose your battles. Which one you're going to you're going to fight for? You're going to push for. So um yeah yeah, I think that it is good to have diversity. You know, um and like you said, you've you've seen a big uptick in people enjoying African homewares. So I've also seen, you know, a lot of more African baskets and seeing the different types of, you know, jewelry and whatnot. So sure, there's always going to be consumerism, but I think that with having a bigger diversity and giving other people a chance to produce something that, you know, that, that it, it can only be good. (laughs) Yeah, we used to. I hear all kind of the debates when now right. the people are saying in fashion. So, right. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a tricky one. But. It is. <laughs> yeah. Well, Jacqueline, it's been amazing talking to you. Thank you so much for sharing uh, Africa Fashion Guide with us and, you know, letting Thank us you. know everything that you're up to. Um, Thank you. Is there 
let us know how we can support you, where we can find you online and all that. Yeah. So um, uh, African Fashion Guide on um, Instagram um, and also have a YouTube channel for African Fashion Guide if people want to get some trainings or see some of the interviews I've done with some amazing, amazing people on a YouTube channel who are doing things in Africa from Dakar to, to Accra to, to um, Lagos to wherever and the continent. You'll see so many interviews there um, with great people. So people should check out Africa Fashion Guide on YouTube and Instagram. And then, as I mentioned about the sourcing platform, it's called Fashion Africa Trade Expo. Um, Fashion Africa Trade Expo is on Instagram and then the website is the same.com and um, people will be able to access that um, shortly, um, maybe at the time of this recording or the time of this, um, this, this is live, then they'll be able to access that straight from that website at fashionafricatradeexpo.com. So, yeah, that would be great. Awesome. Yes, I'm so excited to see how it grows and everything that you're doing. And um, you. my last question is, what does being a sustainable brown or black girl mean to you? What does that mean to me? Wow. I know you gave me this question prior. And <laughs> when I saw your blog, I was like, what does that mean to me? I know it's, it's who you are. For me, it means, uh, as I mentioned earlier, it's going to sound so corny, but it means um, being the change. And even within, because I remember even within going to a lot of these ethical fashion events, there was it was always a you know a group of white people talking about people in brown countries, but there was never the brown people on the stages. Mm-hmm. And I remember reaching out to some of these conferences to say, you know, have the representation of these people to speak. Have somebody from Asia, have somebody from Africa to speak about it. So it's not just, you know, white Europeans or white Americans talking about it, but let's have those representations. So for me, the sustainable brown girl is being that change in the sustainable fashion industry, in the, you know, in the industry full stop. So, um, yeah, making the change and being the change. Yes, that's, that's not corny at all. That's so true. And oh, every you, time I do a Gandhi <laughs> quote, like, that's what we're doing. <laughs> so, yeah. No, you are definitely making a massive change in helping people to discover more African manufacturers and creators. So that's amazing. Thank you so much. Yes. And thanks again for joining us. It's been such a pleasure having you on. Please go follow Jacqueline and Africa Fashion Guide and the new expo. Thank Thank you. you. Thanks, everyone. Bye. If you want to keep the conversation going, follow us at Sustainable Brown Girl on Instagram and Facebook. Check out the website at sustainablebrowngirl.com and send any questions, comments, or topic ideas to podcast at sustainablebrowngirl.com. Be sure to leave a review on Apple Podcasts and tell your friends about your favorite episode. Donate to Patreon if you can, and be sure to watch the full video interview on YouTube. Until next time, let's continue to make better choices for the health of our bodies and the planet. Thanks for listening.